there's nothing in the world quite like Rodeo Drive. I'm Bronwyn Cosgrave. Hello and welcome to Rodeo Drive, the podcast. This is a show about the creators of three world-renowned blocks in Beverly Hills. Today, Montclair and a Valentine to Los Angeles. Los Angeles and Montclair, the first thing you think is like shiny in terms of like glamour and sun. We talked to designer Sergio Zambon about his two Montclair 1952 line inspired by Los Angeles. James Bond, co-founder of the sneaker company Undefeated, and AD3 jewelry designer Aaron Thompson will talk about melding their visions with Montclair. And Booth Moore, an executive editor at Women's Wear Daily, will give us her take. First, let's check in with Kathy Gohari, vice president of the Rodeo Drive Committee and Valentino's director of client engagement. Back in late May, when we launched Rodeo Drive, the podcast, stores were closed due to the pandemic. Soon after came the George Floyd protests. Kathy Gohari has kept us posted about life on the street with an update every two weeks. Now we've reached the eighth episode, the end of this season of the podcast. It's been a momentous time. I asked Kathy how she and other retailers are feeling about the state of Rodeo Drive. Wow, who would have ever thought? Summer 2020, it's definitely going to go in the history books for us all. Um, I want to say that a lot has changed. I want to say that, you know, we have gone through our challenges and we have overcome them. But unfortunately, I don't think I can say that right now. I think we are pretty much where we were last month and the month before. Um, In addition, I think there's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now. Um, We still have a lot of figuring out to do. Mm -hmm. Do you feel better prepared? I mean, a lot of people in the medical community um, and in different industries are saying, you know, we somewhat know what we're dealing with here with the pandemic. Is, is, Is that the feeling of merchants? You know, uh, we're not doctors, for sure, but I do think that as merchants, we have gotten a better handle on how to operate from day to day. Um, I think our procedures are, we're more comfortable with them. I think we are getting more creative and finding new ways of even creating more safeguards for our stores. But I still think that we have the fight still to go on and we are not done. So we need to continue to keep our guards up. Kathy, you've worked in the front line of the fashion industry for decades. Mm -hmm. Just if we could kind of look into a crystal ball, how would you say the pandemic is changing fashion and how could it change the way people dressed for the next few years? It's interesting. I mean, there are different um, schools of thought. Uh, Some think that uh, once we actually see the light at the end of the tunnel and this ends, people are going to go extreme and they're going to go all out and be over the top. And others think that, you know, many businesses and many professions are going to change the way that they do things. I don't really believe that everybody's going to go back to the office. I think we've found a new way, a new norm of being productive in many different fields. So if there are a lot of people who are working from their homes, from their computers, you know, fashion is going to change. Their needs of dressing will change. So I think it will absolutely have an effect long term one way or another. You know, we launched at the height of the pandemic. The protests started the very next day after um, our podcast launch, how have the protests uh, shaped the way the Rodeo Drive Committee and Rodeo Drive merchants are thinking ahead? You know, uh, again, it's a very fluid um, situation right now. There are definitely different teams and we are getting protests. I think almost every week on Saturdays, we are getting protests in Beverly Hills. So we are very aware of what is happening. And we obviously, as a committee, um, don't like the injustices that take place. And it makes us really sad. 
Mm. Uh, thoughts on 2021, Rodeo Drive, where are we headed? I want to see that light at the end of the tunnel come closer. I am hoping by then we have a much safer community and environment and city. Um, I want to see a little bit more happiness on the street. Yeah. Kathy Gohari, thank you for talking to Rodeo Drive, the podcast. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Kathy Gohari is vice president of the Rodeo Drive Committee and Valentino's director of client engagement. And now to a very provocative collaboration between Montclair's Sergio Zambon and four intriguing LA designers. The Genius Project, it's a lot of different creative under one roof, which is Montclair. Montclair launched the quilted goose down jacket for skiers in 1952. It was named for the French village where it was founded, Monestier du Clermont. Since then, Montclair moved to Milan and grew into a global sensation, selling its puffer jackets and coats to fashionistas from rainy London to sunny Los Angeles. It launched an experimental brand within the brand named Montclair Genius. One of the geniuses is Sergio Zambon. He has just launched a new menswear line for two Montclair in 1952. He created it with four LA talents, AD3, Balt Getty, Libertine, and Undefeated. Together, they have produced a collection of jackets, vests, coats, wearable blankets, pom-pomed fur hats, and even some jewelry. It's a mashup as eclectic and unbuttoned as the Southland itself. We'll hear from Sergio Zambon shortly. But to get a sense of what all this signifies, fashion-wise, I turn to Booth Moore. She is executive editor West Coast at Women's Wear Daily. Let's start with the branding. How does Two Montclair 1952 fit into the classic Montclair? Well, there are several sort of subset brands to Montclair that are really interesting because they are sort of capitalizing on this whole craze for collaborations and, you know, doing it in a way that, you know, they revisit their core product, which is, you know, the puffer jacket and outerwear, but they really expand on that with collaborators from all over the world. And they take a pretty risky approach to collaborators. This isn't sort of a luxury brand collaborating with another luxury brand all the time, although they sometimes do that. But are they giving a voice to, say, designers who might not otherwise have the chance to investigate luxury outerwear? Is that what's happening? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, for for this most recent collection, Sergio picked some unconventional brands from Los Angeles that um, are really sort of niche brands and then had a chance to go to this Milan event, which was attended by World Fashion Press and really get this exposure through this incredible platform um, in that way. Why is collaboration fueling fashion? (laughs) It's funny. I mean, I I think it's just there is so much um, content and news out there that one brand doing something is kind of like not as interesting anymore than two. (laughs) And I feel like if it's two that are somewhat surprising to put together, um, it reminds me of like the the Reese's peanut butter commercial, you know, like you put peanut butter and chocolate together. It's it's like, oh, it sort of sparks this interest in um, both in the press and in consumers, um, these kinds of interesting matchups and it, it you know it, it makes it makes a nice bit of of story and content to be commented on on social media and to hopefully drive purchasing because you feel like this is kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity to get this special item it's tastier yes <laughs> what has montclair brought to fashion I think Montclair's done a really good job of taking a core heritage product, which is the puffer jacket, right? And just building a million different stories and pieces of content around it that 
sort of don't rely only on that long sort of stayed messaging around heritage, which a lot of luxury brands, I think, lean too much into, which is the past. Um, you know, a lot of the younger millennial shoppers don't, um, you know, they don't necessarily know about couture level craftsmanship going back to, you know, the last century or, you know, traveling trunks or, or that kinds of thing before air travel. So I think that what Montclair has done is taken, you know, a, a heritage product, a heritage sport product and actually bring it into the future in a way that's surprising. And then they just kind of keep the collaborators coming. Um, just, oh, you can barely keep up with all of them. Mm. There are so many. And so there, there are so many points of entry into the brand, which I think keeps it lively. Booth Moore, thank you for talking to Rodeo Drive, the podcast. Thanks so much. That's Booth Moore, executive editor at Women's Wear Daily. Her column for the industry trade, Moore from LA, reports on the fashion business from a West Coast perspective. So let's hear from Sergio Zambon. Why, I wanted to know, did the mountain brand choose as its muse the land of sunshine and palm trees? Zambon says it began with a pitch to Montclair's president, Remo Ruffini. Well, the first thing is I was thinking why instead of collaborating with a brand or with another designer, we don't collaborate, I said to Mr. Ruffini, with a city which is so much newer and broader and interesting. And so he liked my idea. And what I like of LA is that um, I think it's the city who lately changed more culturally and it went to be an american big city to a world city i didn't so see and i'm traveling a lot in the world such a strong change we're not just talking about new buildings or new projects it really changed in a cultural way and then the fact it's a big city but close to nature the way they work you do business there but you're doing with a laid-back attitude which is very contemporary so I do feel it's it's a really good moment for the city. You're mentioning artists, but something that I really appreciate about Los Angeles and, and visiting there, and particularly Beverly Hills, is when you see someone uh, who's really interested in fashion, I find like the, the style of people in LA can also be incredibly inspiring, the way people dress. Yeah, because in a way, there is a more free sense of style because uh, for a long time it wasn't considered a center of fashion now of course it is in the circle of the centers of fashion and because of this freedom but at the same time we, we shouldn't forget california and los angeles it has always been forward for new cultural costume new idea it's the center of new technologies nowadays and make Los Angeles a, a new center for style and fashion. I will say a lot for style, probably, more than fashion itself. How did you make the cut? I mean, there are many designers working in Los Angeles, many interesting designers and people, creatives. How did you narrow down on the four that you're collaborating with? Well, I narrow down related also with Montclair and also to the needs of Montclair and uh, the size of the company. And uh, I try to give to the choice a uh, credibility through the styles of the creative I choose. Like, for example, Libertine, even if originally it's from New York City, but as it's famous for the crystals, the like Swarovski, for me has the sparkle of Los Angeles. And uh, undefeated, it's the cool sports apparel and sports looks are really Los Angeles, California to me. Then there is also some um, lucky meetings, like I, I met 
a d i i i designer of very nice jewelry at Maxfield, and I choose him as designer for jewelry. And um, I I met uh, Baldasar Getty to a party, and for me it was another side of LA, like the eccentricity of um, a creative person who comes from a certain background and he does street work. So for me, it represents the eccentricity of LA. Hmm. Montclair's design process is assisted by experts in activities linked to the world of the mountain. How did this factor into the two Montclair 1952 creative partnership with Los Angeles? Oh, I, I, I think this is a, a funny thing. There are, <laughs> I have to say something fun and pop. They are both shiny like Los Angeles and Montclair, the first things you think is like shiny in terms of like glamour and sun. And they are nowadays both a crossover, meaning Montclair started as a mountain jacket, but now it's a city jacket. And uh, Los Angeles didn't start as a fashion style city, but it's nowadays, it's a center of, of that. So, if you think to Los Angeles, you, you think a fun, vibrant color. And if when I'm thinking to Montclair and the work I did for, for Montclair, I started exactly from this feeling, the vibrant, fun jacket from the 80s on the Italian street movement called Paninaro. Mm -hmm. That's where I started. So it's about common feelings. But then I really talk with the press office about a guy who goes from the city to the mountains, to the canyons, which is a very LA thing. So the mountain are, you can see from the city and are close to the city. So that probably the more physical relation between Montclair and LA, yes. Mm. Quilting is a signature of Montclair. Is it about, you know, quilting, making quilting the signature or? Well, it started as a technical need because it, it started as a thing to how to contain feathers in the right way so they don't go down. For example, now can be super soft, very flat, with different shapes. And we also do um, the invisible quilting now, which is between two layers. So the jacket is completely flat from the outside and now it has a lot of different variants and um, it's always surprising because there is tons of ways of making different. You were born in Egypt to a Croatian mother and an Italian father. How has your multicultural background informed your work, Sergio? Well, as you said, I'm from a multicultural family. I have relatives all over the world. I'm cosmopolitan by birth. And um, having such a unique and diverse background made me very open-minded. Also, I, I traveled from when I was a, a kid. So my curiosity, which has always said, even when I teach fashion design at the university in Venice, I was always saying to the like, student, the first thing is to be curious. I think curiosity is it's what makes a designer rich. How are you dealing with not traveling these days? Where are you looking for inspiration? <laughs> In fact, not traveling, it's one of the, I think it's the saddest things of this period for me, but uh, sometimes we can travel around the world with our mind. And I, I do have hundreds of books. Um, I go on internet. I, 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 I look at social. So I'm constantly looking at an image. Yeah, a, a creative person, from my point of view, travel every time, also with his mind. Sergio Zambon. Thank you for talking to Rodeo Drive, the podcast. Thank you.
So that was Sergio Zambon, menswear designer of two Montclair 1952 at Montclair Genius. I'm Bronwyn Cosgrave. As you heard, Sergio invited four LA designers to team up on this season's collection. And one of those talents was undefeated. The Los Angeles brand specializes in limited batch, prestige sneakers and streetwear co-created with sports icons and celebrity DJs. Undefeated was founded in 2002 by James Bond and Eddie Cruz. Bond says Undefeated's partnership with Montclair grew out of a friendship between his wife, Karen Kimmel, an artist, and Sergio Zambon. And uh, he was really interested in how Undefeated was perceived. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting that they are where they are in the sneaker brand, but it's also a, a clothing brand. And um, when he was doing the, the, the Genius Project and some, picking some young designers, he thought it'd be great to see what we could do with the uh, Montclair's ability uh, with some outerwear. So I've jumped at the chance. I've, I've been a big fan of Montclair since I can remember. So I was really honored to be able to do the project. Tell us what you did. Describe the collection. Yeah, I mean, we in the beginning, Undefeated always kind of had some of, um, we're not mil- military based, but a lot of the ethos and a lot of the terminology that we use does come from that background, uh, whether it's like a word, Marine or Navy or a color palette, the battle, right? Your life is a, is a daily struggle, war, sport is war. Those are some of our big taglines. Um, so with Montclair, we kind of wanted to tap into that theory and go back into some of the vintage uh, 50s, 60s uh, graphics and terminology and colors of what those pre-World War II Korean era style colors and styles were like. You are listening to James Bond, co-founder of Undefeated. You could say the edgy streetwear brand has made it to the top of the fashion mountain. So I was intrigued to learn more about Undefeated's backstory and how it got started in 2002. Turns out it had a lot to do with a TV show that was a hit in the aughts, Entourage, about a rising young actor, his agent, and band of friends trying to make it in LA. I had a company before called Kavon uh, with my wife. It was a, basically a haberdashery for men. We traveled extensively through Europe. We gathered everything from clothes to accessories, books, music, and we bring it back to curate it kind of a, what I thought men would want uh, in, in any environment, whether it's Los Angeles, New York, uh, coming from the East Coast. Um, and at the time, uh, Los Angeles really wasn't ready for guys to wear shirts and ties before Entourage really got guys to wear suits more uh, tailored to them. Um, it was still very casual, denim, t-shirt, etc. Um, in that process, Nike uh, Europe had been traveling through Los Angeles a lot because it was a new territory and was coming into the store. And they were sending me shoes to just kind of test more of their, they called the probe account at the time, more of the designer artistic version of their sneakers and it was giving them feedback and they really enjoyed uh seeing a different consumer at the time it wasn't such so much sports where it was more what that fashion uh, consumer was doing on with sneakers a kind of a mix like a high low mix type thing exactly so it wasn't so much like a nice suit with a dirty pair of converse it all of a sudden became a nice running silhouette or uh you know a different way of looking at how air force ones or dunks were worn uh, with fashion. Um, and in that process, I met Eddie, uh, who had a store union down the street. And we uh, had a couple of lunches, hung out a bit and kind of thought, hey, man, I have this new concept. He had the environment and he really had the consumer. I had the product. And so we forged together and we created Undefeated. So when you say Eddie had the consumer, how? Uh, his store was more rooted in our culture at the time, Union and Stussy were more kind of core based with the person that was really the undefeated customer. Um, I had more of like the film industry, I had the actors, the artists, but Eddie really had kind of the inspiration of what the sneaker business is today. Interesting. You mentioned Entourage. Mm -hmm. How did Entourage change it up for men's fashion and, and were you connected to the show at all? 
Um, wasn't connected to the show, even though uh, Rob, who created the show, was uh, Rob Weiss was a friend of ours. Um, how it changed it was I think it really brought in a sleeker, more sexy version that men can be that but still be masculine. Um, you know, they the suits really, you know, Jeremy Piven wore a suit really well. So I think a lot of guys who were in that industry all of a sudden liked kind of what that character was about. You know, the fast money, um, I'm, I'm, I kind of falls to the wall, I'm going to say what I want. Um, and I think a lot of guys kind of resonated with that. And in that, they, they kind of embrace that culture. They embrace that style and his fashion sense. And then there's the whole Japanese, a bathing ape. Is this mm -hmm. a sort of global movement? The Japanese part was because the sneakers are really kind of their culture in the 80s, or I would say more than 90s, early 2000s. Like they really embraced that sneaker culture, especially Nike. Um, so when we opened Undefeated, it had kind of that, it wasn't something like a typical store. So it had a little bit more flavor of based on our travels and what we saw. So it appealed to a large Asian consumer, um, but they were based here. And then they would talk to the friends or friends would travel. This is all before, you know, social media really blew up. But can we talk about the sort of collaboration culture? Mm -hmm. Why is it important to fashion? Uh, when we do a collaboration, I want to look for something that I can't do. I want to look for something that I really, you know, whether I'm working with the neighborhood or like, you know, we did Montclair. I love the, the jackets. I can never make a jacket like they do. So I want to do a jacket with them. I want to do accessories with a company, you know, that I would love or I'd love to do a watch with Rolex. Like you want to go as undefeated. We try to aspire to go to the brands that we aspire to be and give it our lens and see what we can create. We really like to show um, the opportunity that we are a real brand and that we are. We've been here 20 years. You know, it's, it's not by a fluke, you know. Um, so it's nice that you're also seen by your peers as someone worthy enough to also put your brand next to their brand. James Bond is the co-founder of Undefeated. If teaming up with a sneaker company was a radical move for Montclair, perhaps even more intriguing was bringing in a jewelry designer. Aaron Thompson garnered a following for his line of ball chain diamond necklaces. He grew up in the San Fernando Valley, went to the London College of Fashion to study costume design, and came back to LA where he's built his jewelry design career. He founded AD3 about a year ago and was selling it and working at Maxfield Boutique in West Hollywood. One day, in walked Sergio Zambon. And it really kind of just, you know, happened very organically. Um, I had met um, Sergio then, and, you know, he was super surprised to see that I worked at Maxfield. He's like, oh my God, you work, you work here? <laughs> like, how amazing. I get to meet the designer um, of this brand that I'm in love with. Um, and I was able to kind of take it out and show him the pieces. And, you know, my pieces are set with uh, VVS diamonds. And so the shock factor, I think, when you walk towards this piece that you think is just a ball chain necklace, and then you pick it up and you see this bling just kind of staring at you, it has a different message. You know that you're looking at something different. And we put them on him. We, you know, I let him kind of like accessorize them. And then throughout the, his time in the store, I looked at my Instagram, I was like, oh my God, I, I follow this guy. <laughs> and so we kept in touch and it was just only maybe a couple months later that I received a message from him saying, you know, can I get your email address? <laughs> and I was like, well, what do you need my email address for? Um, and then following up came a, a email from Montclair asking to, if I was interested in collaborating on that with them on their genius collaboration for 1952. So tell us about what you created and talk us through the production process. So um, what I created for them was uh, the ball chain necklace that I do, um, but I had to change the materials a bit um, because we wanted to be more approachable to a wider audience. Um, my, my pieces um, by themselves uh, will go for anywhere between you know, 6,000 uh, to up to, you know, in the hundreds of thousands. So what I ended up doing was changing the materials up a bit, obviously. Um, we went with a um, standard ball chain that is taken um, and dipped in an 18 karat um, plating. 
Um, and that ball chain is now done in different sizes um, for the collection. So I did one as a um, short necklace, um, which is the one I usually wear. Um, and then there was a longer one that was supposed to go over um, some of the puffer jackets that was that were um, done in the collection. Um, and then I did a bracelet. Um, with that, I wanted to figure out a way of linking um, that world together, um, but also sticking to my DNA. Um, I created a, um, a tag, basically, which is almost like a hallmark stamp um, of what older um, metalsmiths would use or, or goldsmiths would use. Erin, AD3 is the first jewelry collection that Montclair has collaborated with. Can you talk to me about Sergio explaining why you, first of all, and why jewelry uh, should be a part of Montclair? It's funny. He said that, um, he told me that Remo said he wants necklaces on, over the puffer jackets. <laughs> and, and as that, easy as that. As easy as that. And it kind of became, I think, a hunt at that point then for, for Sergio to find the perfect ensemble that would go with, um, these puffer jackets and why do I think it it kind of has you know that vibe of LA is because you do you know you see it on you know these skater kids from the 90s you've seen it on surfers you've seen it on you know different people wearing it as um, wallet chains you know whether or not they're you know or bikers or wherever these classifications come from the I think a large group of them come from LA. Did you go to the Montclair store amidst this uh, collaboration? I did step in maybe a month or so before COVID um, and that was a, an interesting experience because I was looking around and being like oh my god this is where my stuff is going to be and actually when I was in Italy um, when I was in Milan for the fashion presentation that they did, I had gone into the store in Milan and just kind of was just almost in a dream, you know, like what, looking at the collection, seeing the way that they were displayed, seeing the way that they had um, merchandised everything. It, it was kind of a, a little bit of a dream come true. Tell us about attending the presentation and seeing your work. Yeah, that's 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 that was a such a blessing in disguise. Um, you know, just to even be a part of it. It was you know right, right, right before COVID kind of was hitting, and everybody had to go into lockdown permanently, or it seems permanently. <laughs> and there was the you know everything was set up in different tents. So you had like I think uh, I want to say there was at least ten different tents, um, and then they had the Rick Owens bus. It, it was beautifully done. Um, and I walk into our tent and there is this like three story statue with my chain on it. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it was such a shock to see you know, this this piece just looking at me wearing my chain. So, Erin, you've been talking about, you know, your career arc. Um, jewelry is a very complex craft. You studied costume design. Can you share with us some of, you know, the challenges or, you know, what made you good at becoming a jewelry designer? Not everyone can do that. So I think it was um, concept first, you know, in, in creating, I think, designs for, um, for costume, you have to really have a concept. You have to have a script. You need to have characters. You need to create and build that first, you know, and... Being something that somebody who studied um, costume design, I find that there is such an attention to detail um, that is needed. And, you know, the other day I was actually with um, one of my manufacturers and he was saying, he's like, Aaron, this isn't, this isn't normal. I don't know what you're trying to do here. And I said, well, good, keep telling me that, you know, because I want you to tell me that what I'm doing isn't working for you perfectly because I need to figure out the solution for it. And I'm not going to just, you know, send in a little, you know, stock earring and add some diamonds to it. Like, that's not my design. Your collection will be debuting at Montclair on Rodeo Drive. Do you have any special Rodeo Drive memories or stories that you'd like to tell? <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, I mean, I grew up in L.A., so, um, but I never really left the Valley for many years <laughs> until I sought it out for my own self and until I kind of told my mom that I, I wanted to, to see, see something different. Uh, and I, you know, had knew about Rodeo Drive probably from some song that I heard 
or from a movie or something like that along the way, um, word of mouth. Um, and I knew that that's where they had fashion, you know, and I wanted to always kind of like go there, but I really was like, what am I going there for? Um, I didn't even know any of the designers on the, on the block at the time, you know, um, when I first probably even found out about it. Um, and then I would say it was when I was in junior high, high school, um, that it became something that was more apparent and it became something that, um, I think people started, you know, finding, uh, more as a conversation, um, even, you know, different designers were getting bigger, the names were getting bigger and you heard them and you couldn't kind of run away from it, even if you tried. Um, but my first kind of experience um, on Rodeo was when I, I don't even know how old I was, I was probably 14 or 15, and I asked my mom to bring me, and we walked into the store Iceberg um, that was on Via Rodeo. Um, so I walked into that store, had no business in there, except that I thought that, the, you know, there was some anime, I think they were doing Looney Tunes at the time, and I was like, okay, hey, cool, I know that, and I walked in and checked it out, and I probably bought one of the most feminine pair of pants that I could have left there with, with um, leather stitching at the top of the, the short waistband. Um, and I remember loving them and wearing them to death. And my mom probably, you know, didn't know what to think, but it was my birthday and I wanted them and she bought them for me. And that was really the start of it. <laughs> Aaron Thompson, thank you for talking to Rodeo Drive, the podcast. It was such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. That was Aaron Thompson, jewelry designer and founder of AD3. I'm Bronwyn Cosgrave. It has been a joy to take you with me on this journey into the past and present on Rodeo Drive. Over eight episodes, we have traveled back to the 1960s when Fred and Gail Heyman founded Giorgio Beverly Hills and put Rodeo Drive on the map. We followed the amazing story of Bijan, and we had Michael Chow reflect on his groundbreaking Giorgio Armani boutique. Ruth E. Carter told us about costume and fashion for a more diverse era. Jay Leno talked to us about his illustrious car collection, and we learned why collectible cars are inseparable from luxury clothes. We hope you have enjoyed this season. If so, please rate and review the show and share it with your friends. And follow us on Instagram at Rodeo Drive and at rodeodrive-bh.com for updates from Rodeo Drive. Rodeo Drive, the podcast, is presented by the Rodeo Drive Committee with the support of the City of Beverly Hills. It was written by Francis Anderton with editing and audio production by Avishai Artsy. Brian Banks composed the theme music. Livia Mandul, Callie McConnell, and Guthrie McCarty Bashan are the production coordinators. The executive producer is Lynn Winter. Thanks for listening. Thank you.